So the first thing we're going to do today is we're going to talk about uh, polar coordinates. Specifically, we want to be able to do this uh, volume calculation, <laughs> this volume calculation, uh, if we're doing it in polar coordinates. <coughs> so this is section 14.3, which is called polar coordinates. coordinates. Okay, <coughs> so then in the previous section, in the previous section we did uh, the integral, the double integral in rectangular coordinates, and the way we did it was like so. So I take some kind of region, okay, so then now before I make further marks all over this, I'm going to make a copy of it. <coughs> okay, so then in rectangular coordinates, the way we did is we said, okay, we're going to make a mesh. And basically we're going to partition the region we're going to integrate over into many different rectangles. And then we said, okay, over each one of those rectangles, we're going to fit a box. We can compute the volume of each one of those boxes. And then we can perform an estimate for the volume by saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to estimate the volume that is under the surface by computing the volume of each one of those boxes, adding them all together, and depending on what scheme we chose, this was either an underestimate or an overestimate. And in, in either case, such a thing is called a Riemann sum. And if the lower sum converges and the upper sum also converges, and they also converge to the same thing, then this surface is said to be integrable. And then we said, well, then there's Fubini's theorem. Fubini's theorem says that the double integral can actually be computed by doing an iterated integral in either order. Okay, depending on if the region is horizontally or vertically simple. So does everybody remember that's the way it was with rectangular coordinates? Okay, so with rectangular coordinates, it was essentially, we're going to try and decompose this volume into infinitely many infinitesimal boxes. And the reason why is because we're trying to decompose the, the area, the region to integrate over into infinitely many infinitesimal rectangles. Okay, so we're rectangles because that's rectangular coordinates. Okay, so now we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to do it in polar coordinates. Okay, we're going to do it in polar coordinates. Okay, so then we're going to decompose this region into uh, infinite, infinitely many infinitesimal polar elements, and this is how it will look. So, first off, the coordinates for rectangular are what? What are their names that we usually give them? x and y, and what are the names we usually give the coordinates for polar? r and theta, right? So theta in particular is a what? Angle, right? So, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to decompose the angular portion, so something like this. Okay, so then maybe I'll draw just a couple more angles just to make sure it's I cover the whole thing there. <coughs> okay, so that's I decompose the angular portion. So now that's what theta does. Theta represents angle. R represents what? Radius, right? In particular, it represents distance from the pole, uh, meaning the, and in this case, the pole is the origin. Okay? So incidentally, just as a matter of terminology, when you're, the, this is called the origin in rectangular coordinates. This, in polar coordinates, is called the pole. And the reason why it's not usually called the origin is to distinguish the fact that, well, if the radius is zero, you're always at the pole. It doesn't matter what the angle is. So, for example, if r is zero and theta is pi over two, that's the same position as, on the, on the polar coordinate plane, as if r is zero and theta is three pi over two. Right, so then that's the reason to call it the pole instead of something else. Okay, so now I'm going to try this. Let's see. I'll make... Let's see if I can do it. 
Okay, so I'm going to make some concentric circles here. And I'll move them into position. <laughs> Look at how cool that is. Okay, so there's one. There's another. Oh, this is going to take a long time, isn't it? But that's okay. So we're decomposing this thing. <coughs> I'm making larger and larger concentric circles. <coughs> this one. Oh, I didn't do it. Can you believe that? Do it. Okay, good. Okay. So we're just making concentric circles here. <coughs> Okay, and I need one more, maybe. And then you can just believe me that it could, it could go on being beautiful. Okay. Okay. So then the shapes, the shapes that we are, uh, that we're making, they're not rectangles anymore, not like the one over here. Right, these were rectangles. These, these are called, uh, well, I don't, I don't know a specific name, but I always call them annular regions because each one of these uh, areas between two concentric circles is called an annulus. So then if you take two concentric circles, the area between them, and then you cut it, the area between two angles, that's a, a piece of an annulus. So, for example, we might be considering this annular piece. And that's a little annular piece. Okay, and it's not a rectangle. Okay, but nevertheless, nevertheless, over, over that annular piece, now there's a surface over it, if we're assuming for a minute that there's a function, there's a surface that's over it. We'll say that the surface is positive for now, just for conceptual. Then I can, I can extrude this, this annular piece up, okay, as high as it'll go, until it reaches uh, the surface. So I want to find the tallest element, right, box-like thing, that's over this, but under the surface. So just like constructing boxes uh, in the rectangular case. So <coughs> let's, say, let's say that there are n such annular pieces. Okay, there's n of them. I'm going to refer to this one as Ri. So the ith one, and I'm going to say that it has area delta i, uh, delta a i. <coughs> okay. So then, you can see that using this definition, if I further define m i in r i is the position. position such that <coughs> f of mi, so this is vector mi, so this is some position, <coughs> is minimal, then f of mi delta ai, like so, that is the volume under the surface, which is over that annular piece. So then now I can say for then for I'll sum up the volume of each one of them. <coughs> so the lower sum <coughs> is the sum from I is one to N of F M I <coughs> Delta A I. Okay, so that's the lower sum. Now, so if we make the same sort of scheme where we say, okay, I'm only going to include annular pieces that fit entirely within the region in question, and I'm only going to choose heights that fit entirely under the surface, then this would be an, o an underestimate, which is why it's called the lower sum. So in, in an analogous way, I could construct an upper sum, and in exactly the same way, we can interpret these as Riemann sums. And then if the lower sum converges and if the upper sum converges and if they both converge to the same thing, then this function is said to be integrable. And just like in the rectangular case, what is a sufficient condition for a function to be integrable? If it is 
continuous over a closed and bounded region. Okay? Wonderful. <coughs> so the real question I drop my mic. Let's see here. This I'm sure this is gonna sound hilarious on YouTube. Okay. <laughs> okay. So then the real question is is uh, how do you change, you know, what what does this become? Right? So then in the rectangular case, in the rectangular case, <coughs> we had this. You know, we had the double integral over r of f of x and y dA. And in a sense, because of Fubini's theorem, we were able to say that, well, dA, dA can either become dx dy or, or what? dy dx. Okay, so the question is, is, okay, what about in the rectangular, or what about in the polar case? Okay, so in order to analyze that, <coughs> Let's look at what a, how a polar, a annular region uh, appears. So, so let's say I have some annular region. Okay, that's supposed to be a circle, and there's another circle. Okay. So then, now let's say that this is some angle theta 1, and this is uh, some other angle theta 2, and this is some radius r1, and this is some other radius r2. And the question is, is what is the area of such an annular region? Okay, so then the way we're going to compute the area of this annular region is by remembering the following that and this is something we already talked about earlier in the semester if you have a shape like so what's what is this shape it's called a a sector a sector what is the area of this sector one half theta r squared, right? So you should remember that because, because, right, a, a full circle, that's just a special case of a sector with, that has a full rotation. So then, if this has radius r, then what is the area of a circle that has radius r? Pi r squared, pi r squared. So then I'll write it like this. It's equal to one half two pi r squared, right? So it agrees with the for, with the with the area of a sector. Okay. So then now to find the area of this annular region, we're just going to subtract the areas of the two sectors. That is to say, that the area of this region that I'm trying to find that looks like this, I'm going to say that it is this one minus this one. Right, the area of a big uh, sector minus a smaller sector. Okay, so then this is the area I'm looking for. <coughs> this one, this one will be. Now I'm going to refer, I'm going to refer to this angular change as delta theta, and I'm going to refer to this radial change <coughs> as delta r. I need green. So that now I'm referring to this angle here as delta theta. Okay. <coughs> so then this will be one half delta theta and then what? R2 squared. Right, because that's the bigger one, and then minus one half delta theta r one squared. <coughs> uh, 
Okay, so then now you can see that there's common factors. I can factor out one half delta theta. So then one half delta theta multiplied by R2 squared minus R1 squared. Okay, now I'm going to factor this difference of squares as follows and say that, well, this is one half delta theta. And how can I factor R2 squared minus R1 squared? Right, the sum multiplied by the difference. <coughs> okay, so then now, specifically what we're going to do now is we're going to consider, consider the case, right, here's a formula for the, angle, for the area of a sector. Okay, but this is, in a sense, the area of a sector that has you know, non-infinitesimal size. What we want is we're, we want to consider the infinitesimal version of such an annular region. So, now, to make an infinitesimal annular region like this, then R1 is going to go to R2, right? They're going to go to the same value, in a sense. Okay, and theta1 is going to go to theta2, okay? in a limit procedure, if you like, right? So theta1 is going to theta2, r1 is going to r2. So for this re reason, I'm going to rewrite this just a little bit and say, well, this is, this is delta theta multiplied by r2 plus r1, r1 over 2 <coughs> multiplied by r2 minus r1 and so then now, in the limit, infinitesimal case, where theta1 is going to theta2 and r1 is going to r2, <coughs> then each one of these quantities becomes something something else. So this delta theta, so in the limit, in the infinitesimal case, delta theta changes its name to, to what? D theta. Okay. So then now I'm going to say that this is just some common value r plus r over 2. And then r2 minus r1, well, up above, I called that delta R. Delta R changes its name to what? DR. Okay, so now this one's going to change its name to DA. <coughs> so then now, R plus R over 2 is what? Just R. So then, this is D theta R DR. So then finally, DA is R dr d theta. Okay, so this is the geometric reason, right, this page, this page, this one, is the geometric reason that dA, the dA in the double integral, okay, when you, when you convert to polar coordinates becomes r dr d theta. Okay, so if you're in rectangular coordinates, you can have uh, dx dy or dy dx and in the polar coordinate case, r d r d theta. So any question about this? <coughs> okay, so then let's summarize what we've said today so far. The summary is that if you are given a double integral like so, Then the polar coordinate transform, so first off, what is the polar coordinate transform for just the variable x? r times the cosine of theta. And for y? r times the sine of theta. Now, those are the, the algebraic transformations. Some consequences of these are things like, uh, you know, x squared plus y squared is what? r squared, and then other things like y over x is what? Tangent of theta, etc. Okay, so these are algebraic. 
These are algebraic transformations. Okay, so then what does dA become? We just wrote it on the previous page. <laughs> R dr d theta. So then this is just is quite similar in this way to doing a U substitution. Okay, so then it becomes right the double integral over R of F of R cosine theta, R sine theta, and then R dr d theta. <coughs> so I promised a joke, right, or threatened a joke or whatever on Tuesday <laughs> about pirates. So then, did you know that pirates really like polar coordinates? Okay, you know, because, you know, they know that they have to sail the seas and they're on a on a sphere and you know they have to measure angles and things like that so they really like polar coordinates <coughs> and you can tell that pirates must have come up with this in the first place because what does the differential area element become it becomes r dr d theta right all right isn't that isn't that pretty awful okay but ne <laughs> nevertheless okay i just want to bring that out okay because I find that students leave this off a great deal, okay? And the only thing I can say about that is they're not really channeling their inner pirate, I guess, right? R, D, R, D, theta. Okay, and I don't find, I don't, I don't mind, you know, being silly as long as you remember it. I tell you, about every other year, I hear students, you know, like in the exam or a quiz or something, and they're going, you know, <laughs> trying to think, you know, they are. <laughs> well, that's okay, because if you're ever a teacher, you should try things like that. Like in college algebra, I always sing the quadratic formula, right? But then I have, then students are singing it during the exam, and that's fine. <coughs> okay, so let's do an example. Yeah, it can be sung to the tune of Frere Jaca. Okay. <laughs> It I won't sing it all, but it starts out with negative B plus or minus, and it goes on, right? And I hear students humming it. Mm -hmm. so oh, it goes to pop goes the weasel too? That's good. That's good. I've never done that one. Okay. <coughs> okay, we've got to be serious here for just a minute. Okay, so then, so integrate... integrate uh, f of x and y is x squared plus y over the region bounded by these two uh, equations, x squared plus y squared is equal to 1 and x squared plus y squared is equal to 5 <coughs> and it says using polar coordinates okay so then the first thing you should do is you should draw a sketch of what's happening Okay, so then the first equation, what's that? Circle. Okay, and the second one? Circle. Okay, so we're talking about the region between circles. <coughs> so then the region looks like this. Okay, what's the name for such a region? An annulus. Okay, so then now, even if I didn't say using polar coordinates, okay, the fact that this region is an annulus should really be a hint to you that, oh, maybe it would be easier if I converted to polar coordinates, okay? So even if I didn't say that. So if you see an annular region it's probably or an annular sector, then good idea that may need to convert to polar coordinates. Okay, <coughs> so then let's figure out the limits 
the limits of integration in polar coordinates. Oops, <laughs> not that, this. Okay, so then what angles do we need to integrate over? Right, 0 to 2 pi, right? 0 is less than or equal to theta is less than or equal to 2 pi. Okay, that's because, you know, if I draw, if I select an angle, what angles do I need to integrate over, right? A f one full rotation. Okay, so all such angles. Okay, so now let's say that I select some angle so that I can see what radii I'm supposed to integrate over. Okay, so then, oh, wait, let's do it like, like this. So then, do I need to be integrating in here? No, that's, that radii is not far enough. So then now, I need, to in, I need to follow this radii, not integrating, not integrating, not integrating, and then I start here. This is the radii that I start integrating at. What radi ra radius is that? One, right? So you start at r is one, and then you integrate, 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 and stop here at r is five, right? Good. So then, so then, it is from one is less than or equal to r is less than or equal to five. <coughs> yes? That's correct. Ah, good point, right? He's the only one that's taught. <laughs> Look, so then this is a circle, but it doesn't have radius 5. It has radius what? Square, square root of 5, right? So this is the square root of 5. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, 5 would have been... M my, the arithmetic might have been nicer, but I don't know. Okay, <coughs> but, but it would have been wrong, okay? So that's what's important. Okay, so then now let's... Let's perform the double integral, so then the iterated integral. So then I'll write it first like this, right? We want to integrate over some region, x squared plus y dA. Okay, so then now we'll worry about the limits in a moment. What does x become? R cosine theta. Right, so this is r squared times the cosine of theta squared. And then what does y become? r times the sine of theta. Okay, and what does is, what is the, the area element dA become? r! <laughs> r dr d theta, good. r dr d, uh, dr d theta. Okay, so then now, the what limits are on the outside? The theta limits, right? Okay, so then this will be from theta is 0 to theta is 2 pi. Okay, and then this will be from r is 1 to r is the square root of 5. Okay, so does everybody understand how this uh, transformation occurred? Okay, now from here, from here it's just an iterated integral and you do it in the same way that we <coughs> have already done several different cases. So do we want to see this or do we want to go on to something else? Do you want to see me do it? Yeah? Okay. I was hoping you'd say no, but <laughs> that's fine. So theta is 0 to theta is 2 pi. Okay, so then now <coughs> I need to do this inside integral with respect to r. So then I'll multiply this r through to get something like r cubed the cosine of theta squared plus r squared multiplied by the sine of theta. Oh, and this need ah, okay. So this, this, this. Okay, so from r is one to r is square root of five. <coughs> dr d theta. So then now inside of the square parentheses, we just have a calculus one integral. Okay, with respect to r. So then what is the what is the uh, theta is two pi. What is the antiderivative of r squared cosine of r cubed cosine of theta squared with respect to r? Yes, r to the four over four times the cosine of theta squared. So why is that the case? 
cosine of theta is a constant, right, with respect to r. So then in a similar fashion, this is r cubed over 3 evaluated from, <coughs> uh, multiplied by the sine of theta, and then this all is evaluated from r is 1 to r is the square root of 5 d theta. Okay. <coughs> So theta is 0 to theta is 2 pi. OK, so now we plug in the square root of 5. So the square root of 5 to the fourth is 5 times 5, which is 25. So 25 over 4 multiplied by cosine of theta squared. And then plus, so the square root of 5 cubed is 5 square root 5, so 5 square root 5 over 3 times the sine of theta. So that's what you get when you plug in square root of 5. And then minus, <coughs> minus 1 fourth the cosine of theta squared. And then plus 1 third the sine of theta d theta. OK, so any question on how we arrived here? <coughs> Okay, so now this stands some algebraic simplification before we proceed further. Okay, so now this is 25 over 4 cosine squared minus 1 over 4 cosine squared. So altogether that's 24 over 4 cosine squared. 24 over 4 is what? 6 cosine squared. Okay, so 6 cosine of theta squared. <coughs> okay, now this is 5 square root 5 over 3 minus 1 over 3 sines. So this will be plus 5 square root 5 minus 1 over 3 sine of theta. <coughs> d theta. Okay, so any question on how we got here? All right, so then now this is just, this is turning into a, a circus. Okay, so then now, the antiderivative of sine is what? Negative cosine, right? Don't forget these things. These are really important, right? Wow. Okay, <coughs> so then how do you compute the antiderivative of cosine squared? The power reduction uh, formula for, s for cosine? Okay, good. <laughs> So this will be theta is 0 to theta is 2 pi. So then there's a division by 2 in the formula, so I'll say 3 multiplied by 1 plus the cosine of 2 theta. So then that lets me reduce the power on cosine, and then this thing is unchanged. So 5 square root 5 minus 1 over 3 sine of theta, d theta. <coughs> okay, so now I can integrate each one of these. Okay, wonderful. So then this will be 3 theta, and then plus 1 half the cosine, uh, no, 1 half the sine of 2 theta. So that's the antiderivative of 3, and the antiderivative of 3 cosine, so this should be 3 halves. Okay, then plus, no, minus, 5 square root 5 minus 1 over 3 cosine of theta. And then now all of this needs to be evaluated between 0 and 2 pi. <coughs> okay, so now since I'm in a hurry. Ah, look at that. Okay, so then I'll just tell you, if you were to do this very carefully now you and plug in, you would get 6 pi. Okay, but now we got to let the program crash here. Bye. We're going to lose like 10 minutes of notes. But that's okay, I'm recording. <sighs> Come on. Sorry? Well, I save every, every few minutes, but I haven't saved maybe once during this question. Come on. New machine. All right. Yeah, I'm aware that it died. <laughs> Uh, 
<coughs> we'll see where I was. Java update. Give me a break. Okay, so open. What day is it? This one? This day? Yes, this day. Okay, so I got some of it. Well, so, okay, so then now, there was some stuff here that we missed, and then after that, 6 pi. Okay? <laughs> no. Okay, so any question about this example? Okay, so now I want to do one more, and then we can move on to something else. <coughs> Okay, so I want to do, where is it? Yeah, that one looks good. Okay, so here's an example. I want you to compute the following integral. So integral from 0 to 2. integral from y to the square root of 8 minus y squared. Okay, and the thing we're going to integrate is the square root of x squared plus y squared dx dy. Okay, so then the first thing I'd like to point out is that really I think it would be appropriate to write these things here where the book doesn't. Okay. <coughs> now, ignore the limits momentarily. Do you know how to compute the antiderivative of the square root of x squared plus y squared with respect to x? And the answer is... Maybe you do, but so then how do you do that, right? You do actually know a way. We taught you how to do this in Calculus 1, except there weren't some Y's. So now just close your eyes and imagine that that Y is 1 for a minute. Would you know how to compute the square root of X squared plus 1? Use a, a trigonometric substitution. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be excellent? Okay, I have news for you. It would be less, a little less than excellent, okay? It would be possible you could do it. But let's not, right? Let's not. Okay. <coughs> so let's attempt to uh, sketch the region that we're talking about and see if it's amenable to polar coordinate transformation. Okay. So what is the region that we are asked to integrate over? So from y is 0 to y is 2. All right, so let's start out with y is 0. On the axis here, where is y 0? The horizontal one, right? This one, y is 0. And so then if I just select another line here, <coughs> I'll call this 2. Why not? It looks like it could be 2. <coughs> okay, y is 2. Okay. Now, how about x is y? What is that? It's a straight line, and, you know, if you were to just turn the equation around and say y is x, then you sh in your mind's eye you should be able to see what that is. Okay, so something like so. Oop. So y is x looks something like that. <coughs> y is x. X is y. Okay, now, x is the square root of <coughs> 8 minus y squared. Now, what is that? It's part of a circle. What part? Which part? A positive part. I agree. But that's not specific enough, right? Is it, is it the middle half? Does that make sense? Not really, right? Is it the, how about, is it the top half of a circle? No, it's the right half of a circle, right? It's the right half of a circle. Okay, <coughs> what is the radius of the circle? So this is, yes, the right half 
of circle with radius the square root of 8. <coughs> the square root of 8. Okay, <coughs> the square root of 8. Now I'd like to ask you a question that should be obvious in retrospect now. <coughs> uh, so I need to move this just a little bit to make my picture look good. And these move down. Yeah, now I'm going to have to grab these other ones and move them back up, get back up there. Okay, so then now, how long do you think this, this part of the, of the segment is? Not two, right? No, this is, this is two. How long is this? Two square root of two, which is the square root of eight. Okay, so then, so then, <coughs> the question is designed so that we have a circle that looks like this, right? It goes through, say, this point, and this point, and this point. Now let's. <laughs> there. <coughs> okay. Right, so this right here is x is equal to the square root of 8 minus y squared. Okay, but now that all these things are drawn, these limits are drawn, we need to figure out just what region are we talking about, right? So you can see that, well, there's here's 1, 2, 3. What region are we talking about? Okay, I see two sectors. <coughs> okay, so then now let's consider this, this area element, dx, dy. Is this a horizontal integration or a vertical integration? Meaning, are we integrating horizontal rectangles or vertical rectangles? Horizontal ones, right? Horizontal ones. So then, what this is saying Right, you need to select a horizontal rectangle between 0 and 2. y is 0 and y is 2. Okay, so in a sense, we need to select a line between <laughs> y is 0 and y is 2. <coughs> okay, then, do, am I supposed to integrate over here? No, not over here. I'm supposed to start integrating when x is what? When x is y. Okay, so then specifically, this is what the horizontal rectangle is going to look like. You integrate, integrate, integrate until you hit the circle like this. So does everybody see how this lower sector is the sector that we're talking about? We're talking about this one. Okay, so then now, does that region have a nice description in polar coordinates? And the answer is, yeah, it's got a really nice description in polar coordinates. What is this angle right here? Theta is 0. And then what is this angle right here? Theta is pi over 4. Okay, so then let's say that we choose such an angle, okay, between 0 and pi over 4, right, like this one, say. Then I should start integrating when r is what? When r is... 0, okay, and then you integrate, 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 and stop here when r is what? The square root of 8, right, because that's the radius of the circle. Okay, so then that being the case, right, it is 0 is less than theta is less than pi over 4, 0 <coughs> is less than or equal to r is less than or equal to the square root of 8. And now we can transform <coughs> the double integral. So the double integral of r, and then what was the expression? Oh yeah, the square root of x squared plus y squared dA okay, becomes, right, so from theta is 0 to theta is pi over 4 from r is 0 to r is the square root of 8. <coughs> the square root of now. What is x squared plus y squared? r squared, right? The square root of r squared. And then the area element dA becomes 
R. <laughs> the R D theta. So now look, I know that that's kind of a aggravating for, for you to hear me say that. <laughs> that's fine, but just just remember, if you don't, if you leave off or get that part wrong, then you're going to have no one to blame but yourself. Okay, so then, so then theta is zero to theta is pi over four. Now, the square root of r squared, that's the absolute value of r, but in fact, I can drop the absolute value, and why can I drop the absolute value? Because what, I what values does r range over? 0 to the square root of 8, right? So then the absolute value of such an r is just r itself. So then this is r multiplied by r dr d theta because the square root of r squared, uh, and then what happened to the other integral here, right? So this one, r is 0 to r is the square root of 8. This is because the square root of r squared is the absolute value of r is r, because r is greater than or equal to 0. Okay, so then this is theta is 0 to theta is pi over 4 of r squared dr d theta. I keep leaving that off. What's going on with me? So r is 0 to r is the square root of 8, r squared dr d theta. Okay, so then now I'm just going to leave the rest of it from here because the interesting part is done, right? The interesting part is drawing the region and considering the proper limits and blah, 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 blah. The rest of this is just an iterated integral. So any question about it? Sorry? The answer is generally wh where polar regions are concerned, it's almost always going to be dr d theta. In fact, I, I don't intend on giving you an example where, where it should be otherwise. Sorry? You, ca you can. You can, but you'll have to do it very carefully with the geometric argument. Okay, so then as it turns out, as it turns out, in this case, right, it doesn't actually matter because this, you know, these regions are, <coughs> this, this specific region is polarly, doubly simple. So that means it's between two, two constants. So just like you know, if I ask you to switch the order of integration and the region is a rectangle, then literally switching the order of integration is just writing them in the opposite order. The same thing is true here. If you're integrating over an annular cut, an annular sector, then switching the order of integration is literally writing them in the opposite order. So if I give you a different region that's not, you know, bounded by two constant angles and bounded by two constant radii, switching the order of integration can be involved. <coughs> Other questions? Okay, good. So now we need to move on to something else. Okay, the basic the basic idea from as far as you know student strategy is concerned for polar coordinates is this: is that if I say using polar coordinates, then you need to use polar coordinates. Okay, so that's the first one. The second one is that if I give you some some integral, okay, and the region you're integrating over is an annulus or, you know, an annular element or something like that, then you should, you may, you know, that's a pretty good hint that maybe this would be a lot easier if I was doing this in polar coordinates. Alternatively, if you were looking at an integral and you can't, you can't tell exactly what the region looks like, but the thing that I'm asking you to compute the antiderivative of looks like you're going to have to use some fantastically awful trigonometric substitution then you might consider doing a polar coordinate transform because if you do the polar coordinate transform it may just all become really simple. Like the last example where you had the square root of x squared plus y squared just became r. Okay, and you didn't have to do any tri trigonometric substitution at all. Okay, so any questions about that? Okay, so now we're going to talk about surface area. Okay, so we're, it was on the syllabus, but we are skipping section 14.4. Okay, <coughs> so then <coughs> surface area is going to be done as follows. So let's say that we have a region that we're going, oop, that we're going to integrate over. Okay, 
Okay, so let's, I'm going to try and be artistic here a little bit. Okay, so let's say the region looks something like this. Okay, now this is supposed to be kind of curvy, right? Okay, so it's some kind of nice smooth region. So now I'm going to I'm going to kind of draw some lines on it so that you kind of get an idea of how it might be shaped. So it's supposed to be kind of cupped a little bit. <coughs> okay. Okay, so is everybody kind of, I hope you can see what I'm trying to draw here. So a curved surface. Okay, so now in this section, and always in this section, I'm going to be assuming that the surface we're talking about, the function we're talking about is smooth, and by that I mean that its first, its first partials are continuous. Okay, so then we're not going to worry about the case when the surface isn't smooth. Okay, so we want to find how much area does the surface have. Okay, so the way we're going to do it is as follows. Now these, these shapes right here, these shapes, what, what are they? Are, well, they, they're not any particular shape, right? Because the, the surface is very curved. But if I, was to make, if I was to make a mesh on this surface, right? if I was to make such a mesh, then all of those little pieces would have infinitesimal size, okay? would have infinitesimal size. And if I could find the area of an infinitesimal one of these, Okay, then I could find the area of the whole surface by doing an infinite sum of infinitely many infinitesimal of those pieces. So now the question is, the question is, is what is the shape of this piece? Is it a rectangle? And the answer is not usually. It can be, but not usually. Okay, so then what, what is the shape here that, that this is? It starts with P. What is it? Not, okay, so no, I'm talking about this, this flat shape in the infinitesimal case. It starts with P. Parallelogram. Ah, parallelogram. Ah, so then what we're going to do is we're going to figure out the geometry, right, and the formula for the area of one of these little parallelograms. <coughs> okay, so then now, specifically what we're going to do is we're going to imagine that... Okay, we selected some point on the surface, and this surface is smooth. And what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in, infinitely zoom into the surface, so that you can no longer see any curvature. And because this function, is, this surface is smooth, we can attach the tangent plane, and the tangent plane and the surface itself are now indistinguishable. Okay, so we have some infinite zoom here. And you've seen this picture before because I've drawn it before. Okay, <laughs> so we zoomed in infinitely far, infinitely close. So there's a nice box. And now I'm going to draw this one. <coughs> and this one. And this one. Okay. So then now, what we want is we want to figure out what is the area of this, of this thing. Right, I'm not try not to clutter it up too much. So I'm talking about this blue parallelogram. Right? This is a this is the you can think of that surface is covered by infinitely many infinitesimal of these. So if I could find the area of this one, then I could find the area of the whole shebang by an integration. Okay. So then now if this is the function 
the surface of the function z is f of x and y, and the function is smooth, then, then, <coughs> if this is dy, and this is dx, then, that is to say that this size is dy, then we already went through the argument when we were talking about differentials to say that what is this size right here, this vertical up and down. So what is its size? It is the partial of z with respect to y and then what? dy. Okay, so we already went through this argument. <coughs> okay, similarly, similarly, if this one over here is dx, then this is d dx, and this is dx, and what is the size of this piece here? The partial of z with respect to x, and then dx. Okay. <coughs> okay. So then now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, this pink vector, right, this is a vector. I'm going to call this vector v. Okay, in particular, it has coordinates in three space. So then how much does the vector v move in the x direction? How much does it point in the x direction? None at all, right? So then its x coordinate is what? Zero. Okay, so how much does it go in the in the y direction? dy. And how much does it go in the z direction? The partial of z with respect to y, dy. dy, like so. Okay, so then similarly, I can make a red vector. Right here. <coughs> I'll call this one U. Okay, in a similar fashion, U right, goes DX in the X direction. It goes zero in the Y direction. And it goes the partial of Z with respect to X DX in the Z direction. So now, what was it that I was trying to do with this parallelogram? I was trying to find its, its area. Now I have two vectors which bound two sides of the parallelogram. Now you need to think back weeks ago, was there some way we could find the area of a parallelogram given two such vectors? Something with the cross product, specifically the, the magnitude of the cross product, right? So this area right here, this area that we want, its formula is the magnitude of u cross v. Ah, okay, so now all we need to do is, is perform the computation. Okay, so u cross v. Right, we'll use that symbolic determinant thing, ijk. <coughs> ijk. So then this will be dx, 0, the partial of z with respect to x, dx. And then 0, dy, the partial of z with respect to y, dy. Okay, <coughs> so then, if you block out the ith column and ith row, then this will be i multiplied by 0 minus, so negative uh, partial z with respect to x, dy, dx. Okay, then minus j, so block out the j column and the j row, <coughs> then this will be the partial of z with respect to y, dy, dx, and then plus k, so block out the k <coughs> column and row, then this will be d, uh, you know, the product of these two minus zero, so 
I'll write again dy dx. Okay, so any question on why that's the case? Algebraically. So this should be fond memories from days past. Okay, so then the length, the length of u cross v, <coughs> the length of u cross v will be the square root, the square root <coughs> of, now those negatives will cancel, so partial z with respect to x squared, and then dy dx squared plus the partial of z with respect to y, and then that negative will cancel as well, dy dx dx squared plus dy dx squared. <coughs> so then you can see that dy dx squared is a common factor. Now we chose dy and dx to be positive increments, so then they can be factored outside of the square root and this becomes the partial of z with respect to x squared plus the partial of z with respect to y squared plus 1. And then now I factor out dy dx. Okay, now I'm going to call this <coughs> the, the area of this infinitesimal parallelogram. I'm going to refer to it as the s. Okay, wonderful. <coughs> so any question about, about this? So then finally, I'll rewrite this one more time and say that ds, so this is a big S, is the square root of the partial of z with respect to x squared plus the partial of z with respect to y squared plus 1, and now I'm going to refer to dy dx as dA. <coughs> Okay, so then the surface area, the differential element, the differential of the surface area is D big S, like this. So how do I recover the surface area S from DS? With an integral, right? So, right, S is the double integral over the region of DS which is to say that S is a double integral over the region of the square root of the partial of z with respect to x squared plus the partial of z with respect to y squared plus 1 dA. So good news and bad news. Okay, so bad news first. This is uh, a formula you simply have to memorize or you need to be able to come up with it quickly like I just did, whatever, you're going to have to use it. <coughs> now, another piece of bad news is that, you know, bad news for everyone, not just you, is that when you have an integral that has a square root like that in it, it's almost never possible to actually solve. Okay, so that's kind of bad news for everyone. It's also good news for you because if this is just like the, just like the arc length case. If when I want you to actually compute the surface area of a surface over a region, then that means that when you actually algebraically make this square root, for some reason, the square root has to magically go away, right, for some reason. Does everybody remember that in previous integral formulas that had square roots? Okay, so it, it applies equally truly here. Okay, so any question about that? <coughs> so now let's do an example of computing surface area. Yeah, things like that. But in fact, computing the surface area of a parabola really doesn't work very good <laughs> with calculus. I mean, parabola has perfectly legitimate surface area, but, okay, because of the algebraic properties of it, you can almost never get the square root to go away. So the answer is, in practice, no. I'm not really going to ask you about that. More, more likely it's going to be about like surface areas of spheres and things like that, things that are easy to deal with. <coughs> okay, or planes. So let's do an example. Okay, so here's an example of how it can be uh, really simple. Okay, so <laughs> let's, let's do it like this. 
No, that's awful. Uh, you know, the, the author of the book doesn't care if it gets algebraically almost untenable. Okay, so here's a very sp special example of a paraboloid that actually works. So here's f of x and y is 1 plus x squared plus y squared. So this is a paraboloid, which opens in what direction? It opens up, and where is its vertex? 0, 0, 1, right? 0, 0, 1. Okay, good. Okay, <coughs> so here's this function. Find the surface area over <coughs> the unit circle. Over the unit circle. Okay. So, so, I'll call, what, what we need to do is we need to compute this double integral. So the double integral over r of the square root of, so what is the x partial? 2x, so 2x squared, and what's the y partial? 2y squared, and then plus 1 dA. So this is what we need to compute. Okay, we need to compute this integral. <coughs> okay, so then I'll simplify it just slightly and say that this is the double integral over the region. And I'll say that this is 1 plus 4x squared plus 4y squared dA. And maybe just by way of a hint, I'm going to write one more thing because I want you to suggest to me the proper course of action from here. So what should we do? Ah, we should switch to polar coordinates. Okay, so there's two reasons why you should consider switching to polar coordinates. Okay. One reason is that the region you're integrating over is a what? A circle, okay, which is a special case of an annulus. Second, algebraically you can see that there's an x squared plus y squared term. Right? Wouldn't that be convenient if you could replace that with just one term? What is x squared plus y squared in polar coordinates? R squared. Okay? Finally, if you were to maintain this in rec rectangular coordinates, right, how would you how would you compute the antiderivative of this square root with respect to x or y? It doesn't matter. How would you do it? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how I would do it. Okay, I, but I, no, I can tell you how I would do it. I would switch it to polar coordinates. Is what I would do. But okay, so then <coughs> let's draw the region. Okay, the region that we need to integrate over. So the region we need to integrate over is a circle. Okay, so then that being the consideration, what angles do we need to integrate over? 0 to 2 pi, right? 0 less than or equal to theta less than or equal to 2 pi. Okay, now let's say that we select a p one of those angles, like this angle, say. Okay, then we need to start integrating at radius what? At radius 0. Okay, and we need to stop integrating at radius <coughs> 1, right? Because this is the unit circle. Okay, so that being the case, right, this is the double, so no longer a double integral, it's become an iterated integral, so from theta is 0 to theta is 2 pi. From r is 0 to r is 1. The square root of 1 plus 4r squared. Okay, and the area, differential area element dA becomes r. <laughs> r dr d theta, right? So then now that that r is outside of the square root, you can see how should you proceed as far as calculus is concerned. 
with a u substitution now because you can say u is the stuff under the square root and then after you do that, ah, then you get a term dr that is a constant multiple of r dr. Okay, so then if u is 1 plus 4r squared, then du over 8 is r dr. Okay, then you can change the limits now if you wish, so I'll do that. So u is 0, you get what? 1, and u and r is 1, you get 5. <coughs> so then this will be the, is it time? Oh. Okay, so then I'll finish this and then it'll be time. Okay, so then theta is 0 to theta is 2 pi. And then from u is 1 to u is 5, the square root of u du over 8 d theta. Okay, so then now this is just some iterated integral that you've seen before. So you should be able to do it from here. So any questions about it? Any questions about it? So just so you know, just so you know, uh, the answer is, the answer is pi times 5 square root 5 minus 1 over 6. Okay, after you do it, perform all of the calculus steps very carefully. Okay, so now she has a very important uh, announcement to make, so I'll hand it over to, you, to her. Hi guys, my name is Jermaine Codera. I'm a UT student. I'm studying to become a middle school math teacher. I'm a senior and I have a project that I have to do. I just wanted you to help me out. I'm studying...